but present yourself to God as those alive from the dead and your members, parts of your body, as instruments of righteousness to God. So it's the idea of obey. If you obey your lust of the sin nature, it will lead you into the into unrighteousness of God. And there is an option not to do it. And the option is not to do it that way is to, for the believer, is to obey the indwelling Holy Spirit, which will take you on the path to righteousness. The sin nature takes you on a path of unrighteousness. I'm talking about a Christian life. And the Holy Spirit takes you on a path of righteousness. That's our lesson today. And you're responsible. You should not obey. Say, you should not obey your sin nature. You should obey the indwelling Holy Spirit. I wonder if I should send anybody to rescue Al. Okay. Verse 14. For sin, the sin nature, for the old sin nature shall not be master over you. Now we've got a connection between the word reign in verse 12 and master in verse 14. Whoever sits on the throne of reign is the master. That word for master means Lord. For you are not under law, but under grace. Okay? Here's what, here's what that passage is teaching us. It won't shut out. I, that'll be it. If it bothers you, it'll be a good job for you this week. That's how we get ministries around here. If you complain, we give it to you. <laughs> um, what we learn here, the word idea, obey, is the idea that we have dual natures. As a church age believer, you have a dual nature. And the dual natures is talked about in 1 Corinthians 3, 1 through 3 by Paul as either carnal or spiritual. You can be carnal because you have a sin nature, and if you walk in the power of the sin nature, you become carnal. If you become carnal, you're on the path of unrighteousness. And it's up to you. You can walk on, you can walk by means of the Holy Spirit and be spiritual and walk on the path of righteousness. It's your choice. Who you obey. <laughs> That's a choice. Who you obey. So we're going to talk about that today, and we'll be talking about for the next couple of weeks about this dual nature in every church age believer. An unbeliever don't have dual natures; just has only the old sin nature. Doesn't have the Holy Spirit. At the point of salvation, you receive the indwelling ministry of the Holy Spirit. We've certainly covered that. So let's have a word of prayer. We'll give Sam a chance to... That's all right, Sam. That's good for your blood pressure right there. That, oh, that it? Okay. I'll have to try that. I could use that idea. All right, well, let's have a word of prayer. Remember, as a, a believer, you're indwelt by the Holy Spirit. It's your responsibility to confess sin. First John 1 John 1.9 says, if you confess sin... He's faithful and just to forgive you and cleanse you. Cleansing takes you out of carnality and personal sin back into the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And in the Holy Spirit, you're on the path of righteousness, not unrighteousness. So confession of sin is important for John 14, 26. The Holy Spirit indwells you in the teaching hour to teach and recall the Word of God. John 14, 26. So let's pray. I give you a moment of silence as a believer priest. Examine at least three areas of sin, mental attitude type sins, sins of the tongue and overt sins, and these should be confessed in silence and in privacy. So you need to get that done.
And so, our Father, we thank you today for all... Hey, wait, before I start, look. I've got a, I've got a couple prayer requests. The Lord won't mind. I interrupt all this time like that. I don't like it. I think it. I think it's more that way the older I get too. To tell you the truth about this whole thing, but Pat Harrison's dad died. If you if you remember that, some of you that were that have been in the church family a pretty good while know the Harrisons and know how difficult uh, difficult the the dad has been in, and he passed. And so we'll we'll keep you informed on on the funeral arrangements and that stuff. So stay, stay tuned to our web, uh, to our internet uh, doctrinal studies for that information. And we'll pass it down through Anne as well. Also, I got a, a, a note, as probably many of you did, on Jim Myers, who is in Ukraine and stuck. I have not heard the last news I got, the last news he got out. Well, the last news I had, they were, the troops were invading and they were shutting down everything and he didn't think he could get out. Good. That's good. That's good. Well, that's good news. Uh, I, that is good news, but one of our missionaries got stuck back in the in behind the enemy lines and and we were, and and listen, his people are still there. I mean, m probably most of them are still there, and probably most of them are armed, ready to die. If Russia thinks these people are going to be an easy pick, he 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 picked on the wrong group of people to take. I mean, they are tough, and uh, we all should be for freedom. We need to really pray for these people. There are a lot of Christians in Ukraine. A lot of Christians in Ukraine. Well, so pray for them as they sort out what they're going to do from the Poland side and beyond. He has a great ministry in Europe, but uh, Ukraine was his people. Oh, now let's return to prayer. <laughs> okay? And so, Father, we come back and we thank you this was important the congregation know that as we lift the Myers before you today, uh, and what good news that was. I had not heard that one. And uh, we pray for our brothers and sisters in the Ukraine. Oh, God, there are going to be a lot of casualties in the church, but not without your notice. May the people have the courage to fight. May the Christians... Know that God is supreme. And may we know that it doesn't surprise us that the, the bear, that the Russians are on the move. The Chinese will be on the move. The Ukraine, the Iran and the Arabs will unite and be on the move. And we just know we're close to the end. Because these are the things that come to pass before the second coming of Christ. And boy, now we're dealing with people that have the nukes. So what should be our, our purpose in all this? Well, we pray for those like the Myers and, and where are the Sextons? Oh God, where are the Sextons in all of this? I pray for them all of our other missionaries in South America and the Philippines and South, Afri and South Africa, into the South America and, and then South Africa. Pray for these people. Pray for America. Oh, God, what has happened to us? It's hard to believe that we have experienced all that we've experienced in one year of the deterioration of a nation. Where is the church? Where are we? We are the light, not just to Moody and not just to Alabama, not just to the South, but not even just to the United States. We are the light to the world. I pray today for the Harrisons with the loss of their dad. 
I know that was, that's been a tough, tough time with him as he's gone through such terrible health issues. Uh, we have so many other prayer requests, but we have Bible study, so we'll pass on that for now. Encourage our hearts today, Father, in the Word of God, because we walk by faith, and faith comes by hearing and hearing the Word of God. How can we walk any other way? Encourage us here to fall in love with the Word of God. For we've made our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. I want you to look at the two top paragraphs of my paper. Because visitors often ask me now why, why I teach the way I teach. So I'm going to tell you why. I have been in the teaching ministry for six decades. In 2023, I will have been actively engaged for six decades. That's a long time. Probably nobody knows it more than I do. It's a long time. And here's what, why, this is what has shaped my ministry to where it is today. I have been involved in the churches of America for six decades from one end to the other. I have been all over America just by the grace of God sending me. And I have been appalled over six decades of taking a look at the church from New York to California to Michigan to Florida, all over the place. They're illiterate in New Covenant doctrines. They're illiterate. If this was a school type of thing, they would be about the second or third grade. They are not high school. They are not college. They are not prepared for anything. And I kept complaining to the Lord over it. <laughs> oh, Lord, what's happened to the church? Nobody's interested in studying the Word of God. Nobody knows. Listen, if I would give just basic little basic test to the people I deal with, and they didn't know. They didn't know anything. They think that morality is equal to spirituality, for example. If they're just a good moral people, God will let them in. God ain't going to let you into heaven because you're moral. And he won't send you to hell because you're immoral. You go to heaven because you believe the gospel of Jesus Christ, and you go to hell because you reject it. <laughs> Religious people think they're going to go to heaven. They're not going to go to heaven anymore than a moral person. You've got to believe the gospel. Christ died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead third day. He's got to be raised from the dead to give eternal life, because dead man can't give you eternal it's nothing. He can't give you eternal life. When Christ dies on the cross, he dies two deaths. He dies a spiritual death, and then he dies a physical death. And it's out of the physical death that he's raised from the dead, and it's out of the raising from the dead that you get eternal life. Be surprised how many people don't believe that. And so through my own experiences, I went back to the church to be a pastor, to sit down and teach as many that would come and listen. It doesn't bother me that my church is not full. What bothers me is whether you're interested in the study of the Word of God as a Christian. That's what bothers me. And so here I am. Now I'm in Moody. I can't tell you how many funny jokes I have gotten about being in Moody. I didn't know there were that many jokes that could be said about being in Moody. Moody is quite an interesting word. <laughs> but I get a lot of funny stuff from friends. They said, where, where are you? And what are the women like? <laughs> you know, I know, I get, and I get some of the funniest jokes. I wish I could tell them all to you, but I can't. So, 
what I've had to deal with over the years was competing with an, a, a basic mental attitude of expanding time that you're willing to set and learn uh, based on commercials on television. <laughs> That's a tough competition. In fact, I've been getting to time them. And the smart ones don't go over 10 seconds. If you go over 10 seconds, then nobody's going to watch you. Even I get bored. So that's what I have to compete with. And I ask you to come in and, and spend an hour with me or two hours with me on Sunday. And uh, I've got my work cut out for me. I don't mind it as long as you're interested. But it don't take long after you come whether or not you're interested or not because it's the length you have that I ask you to set and study. And uh, so it boils down to me to this simple. You're commanded to walk by faith. Second Corinthians 5, 7, you're commanded to walk by faith. And faith that you're commanded to walk by, that faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God, Romans 10, 17. That's my dilemma. Some of you I only get on Sunday, and I understand that. You work like crazy, and you get families, and you got ball games to go to, and I understand all that. I've been there, and I've done all that, and I know how difficult it is. So I try to get the max out of what I can get from you, and so let me get to my study. What often you don't know when you look at the scriptures is whether or not it's a command or not. So in verses 12 and 13, you have three commands there in the imperative mood, and I wrote them on your paper because you can't see what is a command and not a command. In verse, so what I've done, I'm going to show you how I study and how I teach, and so I'm going to show you that. Verse 12, so I took verse 12, I broke it into one section. Verse 13 is in two sections, and verse 14 is in a section. So I got four sections. The way Paul laid this out, he laid it out in four sections. Verse 12, by commands. He gave three commands and one conclusion. Three commands and one conclusion. So I've got, I've got three, four sections. Three commands and one conclusion. 14 is a conclusion. Look at verse 14. Four. That's, he's now making a conclusion. For sin shall not be master over you. See, he started in verse 12, don't let sin reign. Now he talks about, he make, comes to the conclusion, whoever you let reign is your master. Yeah, right? I might have made this up. Come on. All right. So I, I, on your paper, I got you four sections. Watch the four sections. See verse 12? That's one section. And there are three doctrinal points in it you need to know. Or four. I gave, I gave you four. Look at verse 13. That's section two. And I gave you three points. The seventh point is on the back page. Three points. In verse 13, that's section three. I gave you three more points. In verse 14, that's section 4, I gave you two points. So I should have 12. 12 points. 12 doctrinal points. 12 things that Paul says you really need to get a hold of in verse 12, 13, and 14. 12, 13, and 14. Now watch. I wrote them out for you, and I'm going to show it to you in the Greek language because you can't see it in the English. I mean, you can read it in English, but you can't see what I'm going to tell you. He says, therefore, a conclusion to the first 11 chapters, therefore, do not, the word not is a negative, of course, it's the word may, M-E, in the Greek language, and it's a negative. It's used with the imperative, a present active imperative, of the word rain. See the word rain? It's a present active imperative. And the word not that goes with an imperative means stop. It means stop. Right there. A present imperative is a standing command. A present tense is continuous action. This command stands with you forever. 
You are commanded as a standing command. You are commanded to not let your sin nature reign. It's a present. See the word P over baseo? That's the word reign. It's a pre the P is present, the A is active, and the IMVP is imperative. That's a command. The present tense is continuous action. Listen to me now. The A, the A, this is an active voice that engages human volition. When you have an active voice with an imperative, you've got a double appeal to volition. An active voice says, pay attention now, I'm going to ask you, I'm going to command you, stop letting your sin nature reign in your mortal body. The active voice says, pay attention, I, yeah, I'm talking to you. I'm not talking, I am talking to you. Got me? Well, that's the active voice. In the Greek language, it, it calls attention to your volition, your ability, your freedom to choose who reigns on, uh, over your life. Who reigns over your life is a choice that you make. And it's only if you believe that Christ died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead the third day, which is God, you believe that, then you're, you're going to be either carnal because you let the old sin nature reign, or you're going to be spiritual because you let the indwelling Holy Spirit reign. Have you got that? Do you have that? And it's a standing command. There will never be a day in your life There'll never be a day, present tense, there'll never be a day in your life with your feet on earth and not in heaven when this command is, does not apply to you. Do you understand that? Well, I'm just telling you, this is what Paul's telling you. I'm mean, just giving you basic 101 Greek here. So when you have the negative may attached to an imperative, it means stop. Don't do that. Stop, don't do that. And every time he does it, you're going to say, stop and don't do that. 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 Stop and do do it. That's what you're going to hear from God the entire life that you have on earth. Do you understand that? This is a standing command. And listen, he's going to, every time you, you let the sin at your reign and you commit a personal sin... He's going to stop doing that. You said, well, I confess my sin. He says, that's good. That's what you're supposed to do. But stop doing that. You understand? Stop going back to that well to drink. It's poison. You're going to die a slow death. Stop going back to that well and drinking because it's poison. It's a slow death poison. Let's go back and let's just take a look at this verse 12. Therefore, do not let sin, sin nature, reign in where? Where does it reign? What body? Well, he didn't say just body, did he? He said mortal body. Why would he call it mortal? What's mortal mean? Yeah, liable to death. You're going to die, right? We're all going to die one day if the rapture don't come. So you, you, listen, the Holy Spirit, when you got saved, the Holy Spirit took up residence where? In your mortal body. And he's not permitted to leave it until you leave the mortal. John 14, 16, 17, not permitted to leave. They're forever. So the issue is, who are you going to let reign? Stop letting your sin nature reign in your mortal body. Now watch what he says. Watch this next point now, because you're missing this. In your mortal body, that you should obey its lust. 
what is the danger in your life as a Christian to the fact that you're still alive, which means you're in your mortal body. Agreed? You're still alive. You still have a sin nature because it's in your mortal body till you don't have a mortal body. In other words, the sin nature there till you die. You got it at birth and have it till death. That's where you got your mortal body, wasn't it, at birth? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Just checking. You know? It's mortal because you have it till death, right? <laughs> now, in that sin nature that dwells in your mortal body, it has a system of lust. Right? Is that what Paul said? I mean, I don't know. Is that what he... Yeah, that's what he said. In your mortal... That's all right. Look. You know, you got me till 1130... Well, you only have me till 10th of the day, but therefore do not let sin reign in your mortal body. That's your responsibility. Would you agree? Is it your responsibility not to let him reign? Well, yeah. He's going to be there, and he's going to be there till you die. It's your responsibility not to let him reign. That, and if you do, that you should, you should obey its lust. The lust is in the sin nature, right? Obey or disobey is in you. That's volitional. The active voice and the imperative mood shows the spotlight shows on your volition, your free will to choose. You choose whether or not. You choose who reigns in your mortal body. Who reigns? Who sits on the throne of the authority of your mortal body? Do you understand that? So here are, th here are four points. Here are four points that you should get, in my opinion. The, you may have more, but here are mine. First doctrinal point is every church age believer is giving a, a standard new covenant command to stop choosing the lust activity of the old sin nature that resides in your mortal body. You got to stop doing that. You have to say no to that deal. But in saying no to the sin nature, you have to say yes to the indwelling Holy Spirit. Or else you leave, you feel like you've been cheated from something. Well, you really looking at me like, you're looking at me like, you don't have a sin nature and you've never had any sin problems. I would not play poker with you people. You would bluff me out of all my money. The doctrinal point, first doctrinal point is every church age believer is given a standing new covenant command to stop choosing volitional, obey, see, the word obey, the lust activity of the sin nature that resides in your mortal body. Where does it reside? Inside your mortal body. The second divine point, the doctrinal point, is that the old sin nature resides in every Christian mortal body from physical birth to physical death. That's why it's called mortal. You're going to have it until you die. You, if the question is not, how do I get, get rid of it? It's, how do I, I allow it to be controlled? How can The only power that you have to control the old sin nature is this, to choose the indwelling Holy Spirit. The only power over your sin nature is the indwelling Holy Spirit. You can choose Him and He can control your sin nature. You control Him and He controls your sin nature. There's no power in this world. You don't have the power over your sin nature. I mean, how, how many times have you not tried to quit sinning in some specific area and have failed because it has a strong lust pattern in you? And you've tried and tried and tried and tried and tried and tried and tried, and tried right? Why, sure, that's, that's normal. You want a power over it? That's the Holy Spirit. 
the power over it. There's no other power. I'll show it to you today, but there's no other power. You have the power to choose, but you don't have the power to control. Something, something is going to reign over your mortal body. It's either going to be your old sin nature or the Holy Spirit. Indwelling Holy Spirit. One or the other. Well, okay. I was going to wait a little bit, but let's go. Come on. I love that. No, you want it. You got it. Here's Galatians. Let's go to Galatians. I'll give it to you now. Here's Galatians, the fifth chapter. I want you to go there now. The fifth chapter, 16th, 17. Now watch this. I mean, this is dynamite now. Here, here's what does it. Galatians 5, 16, 17. Look, it's okay if you have trouble finding it. Go to the front of your book, see what page number it is, and go to it. It's all right. I just want you to study the Bible. I, it might be difficult. That's all right. Galatians 5, 16, 17. Galatians 5, 16, 17. Galatians 5, 16, 17. Yeah, 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 yeah. Come on. Have you got your Bibles open? Have you got your phone? Either your phone or your Bible has got to be open. If your phone's open, it better be on a Bible. <laughs> okay. Here we go. But I say, here's Paul, Galatians 5, 16, 17. But I say, walk by means of the Spirit, that's the indwelling Holy Spirit, and watch this now, and you will not carry out the desires of the flesh, the sin nature. For the flesh, sin nature, sets its desires, lust, against the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit against the flesh, for these are an opposition, an internal warfare in a believer's life, so that you may not do the things you please. Think about that warfare. You with me? Oh, come on now. <laughs> this will, listen, you've got to learn this to get into transformational life. I want you to get into Romans 12 too. You will not get there. Listen to me, dear hearts. You will never get there unless you get this one down. This is part of how to get into transformational thinking. Where you, where you become the Christ in you, in the way you live your life. All right. Did you write, did you write Galatians out? Did you write on your paper? Thank you. <laughs> You're a good student. Here's the third doctrinal point. The old sin nature operates by a need for lust gratification. How do I know that? Listen to me, because of the word obey. Is that not a strong word? I mean, you talk about a pull in your life. Uh, uh, that's got to be a pretty strong pull that you would go like, I'll be back a little bit later, Lord. I've been praying. <laughs> I'll, be, I'll, be, I'll be right back with you, Lord. You know what do we call that on the other side of that? It's personal sin. Now, some sins pass you by, you don't give it. You don't give them a second look. Other ones, you go like, you gawk and fall out of the car and all kinds of stuff. Right? So you got you to understand that. We're talking about a real tug of war. It doesn't have to be, but it will always be until you learn to submit to the indwelling Holy Spirit as the only power over the flesh. These two war against each other, right? The Holy Spirit's lust against the lust of the old sin nature. They're at war within you. You've got to learn to give it over. For you to have the peace, you've got to turn it over to the Holy Spirit every time. Inner dialogue. Yeah. That you should obey Huputasso, uh, Hupakuo, I'm sorry, Hupakuo, that you should obey to hear and respond positively, that you should obey its lust. In other words, in your mind, when you respond to the lust pull of the sin nature, you want it so bad you're just willing to give up a few things. 
And when the Lord is not the top of your list, it's easy to give that up. And you, so you, you surrender that relationship that you've got going with him because of this tug, this lust, and at some point, you obey. And the reason is for the lust gratification, it is the momentary pleasure in the sin. The momentary pleasure in the sin. And when you're a spiritual person, as soon as that moment is over, there is guilt. There is guilt, there is shame, there is regret, I did it. If you're a spiritual person, that's the way you feel when it's done. When you're a spiritual person. James 1, 14, 15 says, Here's how this thing works. Each one is tempted when he's carried away and enticed by his own lust. At this point, it's not sin. It's temptation. Temptation is not sin. You still have time when you're being tempted. You still have time to turn to the Holy Spirit to give you the power over it. Do you understand? It's not a sin to be tempted. Are you mortal? Okay, as long as you're mortal, people. As long as you're mortal. See the word when? See the first when and the word? Listen, but each one is tempted when? Circle that. Circle that. It's going to be important. Do you circle it? When he's carried away and enticed by his life. They said, we're not in sin yet. We're in what? We're not in sin. We're in what? Temptation. Now circle the second one. Then when lust has conceived, how do, how, how do we know when it's conceived? Because it brings forth birth to what? Personal sin. Agreed? There you go. See, when I was, when I was being tempted, I still had time and room to do what? Turn to the power of the Holy Spirit who dwells in me. Agreed? That's when you should do it. You should obey that. Not to obey getting lust gratification. That, that, that moment of momentary pleasure that's in sin. See? See, I don't have to teach you how to walk in sin. <laughs> You could teach me that one. I have to teach you how to walk in the Spirit. I don't have to teach anybody how to be carnal. My, my, my. But I do have to teach you how to be spiritual, and I'm doing that right now out of James 1, 14 and 15. I wrote on your paper, it gives birth to sin, personal sin. It could be mental attitude types of sin, sins of the tongue, overt sins. Here's my third win. That's point A, point B, and point C. And when sin is accomplished and it's got you walking down the road of unrighteousness, it brings forth death. Here is the key thing to remember about the word death. And this will make sense to everybody in here, even if you're not a believer. It means separation. Would you agree with that? Separation. And what is this death bringing separation from? The Holy Spirit. And what the Holy Spirit brings you to life in the Lord Jesus Christ. And what we call that is carnality in 1 Corinthians 3, 1 through 3. We call that carnality. Here's the fourth point I got from verse 12. The fourth doctrinal point is the warning 
of the danger of letting the sin nature reign or sitting in the seat of authority over the Christian life. See, that's the word reign. Don't let him sit on the authority over your life to produce sin out of self-gratification of the sin nature. In verse 13, section 2, in section 2, do, he comes back, he says, do not, that's May Day, which is connecting, when you get a May Day, that's a conjunction plus a negative, M-E-D-E, and what it does, it connects it to the other M-E. See the M-E in verse 12? Do not, see, it's M-E. When he comes, when a writer, Paul, comes back and puts it M-E-D-E, that's may as a negative plus a conjunction day that connects them together. I'm in verse 12 and now I'm in verse 13. That's close, is that not close? I mean, we're not like books away. <laughs> we're in the same thought pattern. We're in the same thought pattern. Okay. So he's come to a second thought idea on the command. And so he says, and do not go on presenting. Presenting, notice that's a present active imperative, just like the other one. It's a standing command with volition involved both in the active voice and the imperative. That's a double whammy on the volition. Do not go on presenting that I don't have to explain presenting, the members or parts of your body to sin. Parts of your body. It could be your tongue. It could be your mind. It could be your body. Agreed? Your body, soul, respect. All that could be involved in it. It could, it could be mental attitude, sins of the tongue. It could be overt sins. That's why we do that. Isn't it interesting that you're always giving up parts of your body for sin? The sin nature works through parts of your body. It's parts of your body that your mind has said you can get pleasure from it. There's one part for sex, there's one part for alcohol, the one part for drugs, and so the list goes on. You're told to stop doing what? Presenting what? Parts of your body. Isn't that interesting? It's like a it's like a auto parts place. Well, what parts are you getting? What parts have you sold today to the devil? No. Getting personal. Yeah. See, I didn't write this, but this is what it says. Stop presenting parts of your body. And that's 13A. Whew. That's 13A. Do, and do not go on. Stop doing this. Stop. Stop doing this. Presenting. How, how, how do I present? Listen to me now. How do you present your body? Listen to me. James 1, 14 and 15. You say, well, pastor, how do you present your bodies? I mean, I don't know. That I, oh, yeah, come on now. Everybody knows how you present parts of your body. You just probably never heard it from Paul. Now watch this. Do not go, do, stop presenting Parts of your body to sin, watch this, as instruments. But let me tell you what that word in the Greek carries. It carries the idea of a weapon. A weapon 
against righteousness, a weapon of unrighteousness. When you walk in the flesh and commit sin, you begin walking a path of unrighteousness, and that has become a weapon against Christ and the Christian life. A weapon against it. A weapon. See, that's at, J that's at Galatians 5, 16, and 17. There is an internal warfare, one against the other. Right? I just read that. The flesh versus the spirit. So I have a couple points. The fifth divine point, doctrinal point, is a warning to stop being a participator with the lust of your sin nature. Stop doing what, did he say? He told you to stop doing what? Presenting your bodies as a weapon against God. How about that? The sixth doctrinal point is stop using the lust of your own sin nature as a weapon. Here's my seventh point there. There is an internal warfare within every church age believer between the old sin nature that will take you on a path of unrighteousness against the Lord and the indwelling Holy Spirit will put you on the path of righteousness with the Lord. You can be walking with the Lord and for the Lord or walking without the Lord and against the Lord. And so I wrote down Galatians 5, 16 and 17 and the inner dialogue part. Who's in charge? Uh, listen, who's in charge? Listen to me, look up here. Who's in charge of who reigns over your life? You are. That's why it's an active imperative, right? That's why it says stop doing this. You have power over every lust of the sin nature. It is the power of the indwelling Holy Spirit. And it's you deciding who sits on the throne who reigns over your mortal body. Agreed? I didn't make this stuff up, people. Come on. Well, have I not been reading the Bible to you? Okay. So, here's my third section, 613b. Here's section 3. Present, positive. Present, watch this now. Watch what he did. Now you're going to miss this because you don't pay attention. The first two commands were present imperatives. This one he changed to an aorist. It's a hut two command. It's a command right now. And boy, you better wake up. A standing command is like those commands you learn in basic training. They're the fundamentals. They're the foundation. Heirs command. Now the heirs command comes out. They said, boy, you better pay attention. And you better stay on the basics that you learn if you're going to make it through infantry. Because I don't want you to be casualty and I don't want your brothers in, in arms to be a casualty by, by you not paying attention to what you're supposed to be doing. See, it's an aorist imperative. It's one of those <laughs> commands that are given right now. You better wake up. This is dangerous stuff. Present aorist active imperative. Therefore, instead of saying stop, listen to me, instead of saying stop, he's saying start. Get out of your bar, get ready, get set. He's telling you to start. He's not telling you to stop. He's telling you to start.
present yourselves to God as those alive from the dead. Isn't that interesting? Because you're still in a mortal body that's dead. Right? Where, where's it going to take you? Where's your mortal body going to take you? It's going to take you to death. It's going to take you to the grave, right? Hmm? Your body. I'm just talking about your body, not talking about your soul, your spirit. Where's your body? All right. But present, that's a positive. And he's telling you to do it now. He's not telling you to do it tomorrow. He's telling you to do it right now. When you leave this church, I want you to start doing this in your life. Start exercising this in your life. Now. Don't wait till tomorrow. Well, I got a date tonight. I'll do, I'll do it as soon as I get past it. I mean, I got a hot date tonight. <laughs> Pastor. <laughs> Stop that foolishness. She's that good marrier. My goodness. Otherwise, quit playing. That didn't cost you anything. That was counseling. That was so why you're better off with somebody else than me. All right? He says, so I got those alive from the dead. See, this is a sign that you're alive from the dead. And you're, and, and, you now are, are using a weapon for God against the enemy. And the enemy is not within, the enemy is outside. And greater is he who is in you, John 4, 4, greater is he who is in you, the Holy Spirit, than the devil who lives outside of you. How about that? How about that? When you learn how to win the battle here, you learn how to win the battle there. That's what I'm after. Church, we have got to learn this stuff. Here's my eighth point of doctrine. Present yourself as those alive, as those who are alive from the dead. As those who are no longer under the reigning authority of their sin nature. That's when you become alive to God. On a consistent basis. You're the same guy today as you was yesterday, and you'll be that same guy tomorrow because you're committed to this. Stop this wishy washing. One day I'm really spiritual, the next day I'm really carnal, and the next day I'm carnal, and the next day I'm spiritual. Get some consistency in your life and find the joy of the ministry of the Holy Spirit in your life. And find the ministry and the blessings that God the Holy Spirit will bring to your life. If you'll just walk a day or two with Him, you'll see it. Ninth doctrinal point is positive commands start to present our life activities to the indwelling ministry of the Holy Spirit as instruments or weapons of God's righteousness. You have been adequately prepared to be a victor and not a victim in this world. The tenth point. The weapon you use decides which side of the spiritual warfare you've chosen to be on at any given moment in the Christian way of life. At any given moment, you're either carnal or spiritual. You're either using the weapons in a positive way for God or a negative way. I gave you Bible verses like 2 Timothy 2, 21, 22. You should read. Write this down under that point, 10. Write down Ephesians 6, 10 through 17 tells you to put the full armor of God on. You know why? Because we're at war. Many of you don't know. You don't know you're at war. Because you haven't, you haven't been on the positive side of the warfare long enough. We're in war. Let me tell you, an army greater than Russia has invaded us. 
we've been invaded in the United States of America, and he's taken over a lot of churches who no longer teach the authority of the Word of God over their people. It's the truth. Here's my final point, and we'll get out of here. We'll take a break. My fourth section is in verse 14. It's a conclusion. It's the word for, F-O-R. The writer is bringing this to a conclusion. He's trying to make a concluding point. Now, I'm only in verse 16, and we've got a lot further to go in Romans. So he's, in the point, in the, he's making a point with the three imperatives. He's bringing a conclusion of closing idea to the, to the three imperatives. For sin, sin nature, shall not, and he used the ook. Now, before he's used may, M-E means no. It's kind of like this. No, that's not a good idea. That's a may. Here's an ook. No! Are you crazy? There's a little bit of difference in that one. Or we might say never. For the sin nature shall not be master. Notice whose reigning is the master. See that word? It's K-U-R-I-E-U-O. That's a verbal form of the word Lord. That's the verbal form. Notice it's a future active indicative. What are you going to do with your life from this point? Man, I've told you the truth. I've told you how important this is to the Christian life. I've told you how important who reigns your life is a big deal. He has told you in the aorist, start doing this right now. Be a warrior for God. Be a victor and not a victim. Hmm? Because whoever reigns is the master for that day or for that moment or for whatever it is. Right? For you are not under the law but under grace. A letter dying po dividing point, uh, doctrinal point is that each church age believer decides. Captain of the ship. Each church-age believer, that's a C-A-B, decides whether the old sin nature or the indwelling Holy Spirit reigns as master over the Christian life. You should read Romans 13, 14 on your own. I don't write these things down just because I get more credit if I put more words on the paper. These are important to you read. 12. Grace salvation has placed the church age believer under the liberty of God's grace to allow free will to decide amidst the angelic conflict whether he will serve God or Satan, whether he will serve self or, or, or the Spirit of God, either the flesh or the Holy Spirit. And so it is. <clears throat> 